Um, my name is Dave Shapiro. Most of you know me. I'm the CEO at Steel Sports. Um, every quarter we've been having uh, webinars on different topics because we want to offer professional development for all of our coaches. Uh, the coaching staff at Steel Sports, UK League, Baseball Heaven, uh, CrossFit South Bay are the lifeblood of Steel Sports. Uh, so we want to help invest in you so that you can improve and be the best possible coach that you can be. Um, on past webinars, we've had Dusty Baker, uh, coach of the Washington Nationals, Jim Thompson from Positive Coaching Alliance, Paul Solitsky, a professor from UC Davis, uh, Lee Han Hancock, a well-known sports psychologist, and then also most recently, Carrie Cecil uh, talked about social media on our last webinar. Today, I'm, I'm very excited to have uh, Nancy Lieberman be the, the guest speaker for our webinar here. Um, most of you probably know Nancy, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of her background. I think I could take the whole webinar to run over her accolades, so I'll keep it brief. Um, but at 17 years old, Nancy was on the USA basketball roster, and at 18 years old, won a silver medal. Uh, she was nicknamed Lady Magic, uh, as her style of play was similar to Magic, Magic Johnson. Um, she played the WNBA, coached in the WNBA, and was also a uh, GM in the WNBA. Uh, she's also been a head coach in the D-League and coached men's basketball and is currently the assistant coach for the Sacramento Kings, um, which my office actually overlooks. It's where I live. Um, she's on, only one of two female coaches in the NBA right now. Nancy is a, a member of the, the Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, and we asked her to be on our advisory board about a year and a half ago, not just for her accolades on the court, but also what she's done off the court. Uh, Nancy's involved in a lot of different nonprofit ventures, one of which is uh, called Dream Courts, where she's built courts and given thousands of kids the opportunity to play basketball across the country through refurbishing basketball courts and providing equipment to inner city youth. Um, Nancy's values, I think, align very closely with Steel Sports Core values, which you see on the screen and which I'm sure you've heard a lot of, safety, teamwork, respect, integrity, and discipline. So we've asked Nancy to talk a little bit today about those core values and, and what they mean to her. Um, also, I want you to ask questions throughout the webinar. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a question and answer section. If you have questions that come in, just type them in there and I'll stop Nancy as she's going to make sure that some of those questions get answered. So with that, Nancy, I want to turn the floor over to you. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I'm glad I'm on this call. Um, obviously, any of us that are in, in sports or business and life have children, as I do. Core values affects everything. It, it affects every interaction that we have, people trusting us, believing in us, uh, how we walk, how we talk. So uh, I can remember the coaches that had an effect on me, the business people that have had an effect on me. And it's so important for us to be consistently consistent in what we are doing. Uh, that's how people end up, you know, trusting, uh, showing loyalty. And quite frankly, the greatest thing that can ever happen to us uh, as parents or coaches is that people want to be like us. And uh, so when I, I was asked to be a part of talking about, you know, core values, to me, it, it was a no-brainer. Uh, the things that you see on the screen right there, that's, that's just fluff. That just tells you kind of where I've been and what I've done. And I'm proud of that. But for me, uh, kids, what we teach them, we're generation now, and we have to affect generation next. So how do we do that? I mean, how do we connect our values today to kids' values today? And we have to be consistently consistent, we have to have sustainability, and we have to have uh, growth in what we believe in. And that all falls under the, the different categories that we're talking about with kids. We're talking about teamwork, we're talking about safety, we're talking about respecting people, respecting the game, and quite frankly, respecting yourself. If you don't respect yourself, how can we ask you to respect other people? Uh, for me, that that's one of the first things that I talk about. Uh, 
you know, integrity, why, why we do something consistently, why we do things that are uh, intentional. And we, we want people to have intentional greatness. So all these little things that we embody every day, we now get a chance to truly talk about, break them down, see how they um, reflect what we're doing on a daily basis uh, from the day that the good Lord allows us to open our eyes and to get another you know, breath of fresh air. We, we have a chance to inspire people. We have a chance to change people's lives. I mean, even in this morning, um, I was doing a, a photo session and you never know what's, it, the lady was doing, you know, some uh, hair and makeup and you never know how life is affecting them. And she had had a death in her family. And, you know, when we were done, she thanked me for just joking around with her and for being kind. And, and I felt bad that she was thanking me for being nice uh, or for being kind or, you know, uh, just how you talk to people. So these are the things we have to embody every day, and we have to be able to teach them to people and not actually force it down people's throat. Uh, you know, my players, they, they see how we walk. They see how we talk. They see how we interact with people. They, they see if we're, we're full of crap or if we're really sincere. And those are, you know, I, I, always, I always tell people, be who, be who you are in the light that you are in the dark. If you're full of crap, just tell people you're full of crap. And if you really have a good heart and you really care about other people and you lift when you rise, you, you're there to help other people, that's not a negative. That's a, that's a positive. I mean, that's a really endearing quality. And um, before we really even get into this, uh, all these different categories, my life is pretty much like this. The first third of my life, I was learning. The middle part of my life, I was earning being a professional athlete and a business person. And at this stage of my life, I'm returning. I'm on this call today because I care. I'm on this call because I want to help. I want to learn as much as I, I, I would like to be able to share some wisdom uh, with all the coaches. Uh, you're very important to the future of children we know and some children that we don't know. So you have to... You have to be on your A game when you're dealing with them. Uh, on your worst day, you have to come with the goods, okay, and, and not let it affect how we treat people, what we do. We don't want to mortgage safety. We don't want to mortgage our discipline, our integrity, our teamwork. Um, like I said, on our worst day, we should be better than people on their best day. And I'm really proud to be a part of Steel Sports and to be able to share this with, with you guys. Right, so Nancy, the, the slide that I have on the screen, maybe you could just talk about it and go over the quote that we have from you on, um, on safety. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I mean, it is, it's important. I mean, we're responsible. I mean, we can't have things falling on kids. We can't have kids running on wet fl floors or slippery floors. I mean, I've been out there on the court with a mop cleaning up, just like any, I, I'm not waiting for the, you know, maintenance person or my assistant. I, I, I can, sw I can go have lunch at the White House with the president, or I can, uh, I can sweep the floor in the gym. Um, I'm a little anal, for those of you, I didn't put that in my bio, but I'm very anal about safety. Uh, I walk around my basketball camp, we'll have 200 kids at my camp tomorrow, and the one thing for me, I constantly am walking around picking up water bottles or taking towels if there's water on the floor, somebody spilled, you know, Gatorade or whatnot. We don't, we don't want these kids to get hurt. Um, and it's, I'm a little selfish, and I'll admit this. Not, don't, not only do I not want these kids to get hurt, I do not want to get sued, okay? So we, in our coaches' meetings with our staff, we tell them, if you see a water bottle on the court, you stop everything, you pick it up, and you move it away. Make sure uh, 
a bleacher is not sitting right on the edge of the court where if a kid you know uh, falls or trips they're going to hit their head on uh, aluminum bleachers we don't we don't want that so the parents no matter where we are parents are they expect and they demand that we treat these kids and protect them as if they were our kids which i i know that's what you all do so we just have to make sure we also have a, a procedure plan in place like I'm not really good with like blood or any of that gory stuff I'd rather walk through Central Park in the middle of the night and I wouldn't be afraid but if I see blood I'm, I get queasy if a kid and a kid got hurt when you're at my camp he, he put his arm down when he was falling and his bone snapped and the bone came through his skin and there was just blood everywhere we had a Coaches, they know the drill. You take all the kids away. Uh, we have someone calling the parent. We had somebody calling 911 to get emergency responders. And we have somebody right there with the kid, maybe covering his eyes so he, you know, he couldn't see the severity of his injury. Uh, it's those little details. You know, you have to master the things that take no talent. It does not take talent to have a plan in place. It's just a, it's 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 about putting it down. It's about sharing the execution of the plan. And we're all in a gym with kids, and we just have to make sure that they're safe. They're learning the right way. Uh, we talk to our coaches. If play gets too physical, our coaches and our referees have the autonomy to stop play. Talk to the teams. Because, you know, we want you to win, but we want to win the right way. And we don't want to do it at the extent of, of risking injury to another athlete that's on the court. And if somebody does get hurt, we know it's sports. It's kind of occupational hazards. But we want to mitigate those injuries as best we can and, and set these kids up to, to do what they do, which is have fun, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, uh, tennis, whatever the sport. We just want to make sure that we're doing our job, we're thinking ahead, we have a plan in place, and that these kids and the parents feel, uh, as they should, that we're protecting their kids to the best of our ability. Do we have any questions about that? I'll give folks some time to type in here. I haven't seen any questions yet in regards to safety. Um, so maybe let's just go to the next core value, which is teamwork, and then as you're going there, if folks have questions on safety or teamwork, type them in, and I'll stop and have her address them. I don't think that picture was about safety right there <laughs> with the Texas <laughs> Lynn. This is about teamwork now. Those high heels and the bench might not be safe, Nancy. You know, it's it's kind of cool. You know, I'm looking at these pictures, you know, I, and I have Chris Roberts and Justin Detman and Booker and – uh, Joe Alexander and just uh, Ron, Ron Adams, so many of these guys that I stay in touch with. Matter of fact, uh, number 23, uh, Joe Alexander, you talk about teamwork and, and working in a collaborative environment. So I coached these guys in 2011 and we made the playoffs. Joe reached out to me the other day because he saw that my son TJ just signed to play professionally in Turkey at uh, Gala Tassare. And because of the relationship we had, because of how we cared for our players, because we, we wanted to hear what they had to say, we had a thing called 360 communication. Even though, you know, technically I was the boss, the head coach uh, for, for Donnie Nelson's uh, team with the Mavs. It was really cool. We wanted our players to know that we valued what they thought. And if, if they had something they wanted to say, they could say it. And, and we really, we wanted that to happen for them. We didn't want them to be robots. And they have a heart and they have a pulse. And really no question was a bad question, whether you were Joe or Rashad McCants or you know Antonio Daniels. Uh, or quite frankly, our, our team trainer. And you build that. Teamwork is not just the team on the court. Teamwork is how you treat people in the totality of your environment. And, you know, I, I had said this to them, and they were all going through something very historic. 
you probably didn't have all the answers uh, on how they were going to deal with a woman uh, head coach. And but they were they were open minded. We gave them a reason to want to come to practice every day to work hard. Uh, we gave them a reason because of this thing called teamwork. And there was an expectation that uh, myself and uh, David Wesley and Scott Fleming would come with all the information they needed you know, as far as you know, practice, offense, defense, our game plan. There was an expectation of teamwork that they would come, be on time, show up. I wouldn't have to call and go, hey, where are you? Practice started. Um, the trainers were there on time. We, we all had this kind of pact that we were going to be uber professional and that we were going to work together for a common goal. And one of the things, you know, Oprah has her vision board that kind of she sees or has used that um, on things that she's wanted to accomplish in life. Ever since I was little, I really wasn't very little, I was big, but I have, I have this saying, it is called, you have to see it, say it, to be it. See it, say it, to be it. And, you know, when this thing uh, started and Dave was talking about, you know, my background and having been in high school on the Olympic team, and I'm still the youngest Olympic basketball player, male or female, I was a senior in high school won the silver and I was a junior in high school when we won the gold medal at the Pan Am Games and I was you know 16 years old and you know people were always saying you can't do this and you can't do that you're too young you're too inexperienced you're... it wasn't really good teamwork or coaching because people were telling me what I can't be instead of telling me what I can be and empowering me you know mentally physically, emotionally, to, to achieve my goals. And, you know, like a lot of the kids that you're coaching, sometimes we don't know their story. Like, you can look at me today and, like, again, read my resume and, oh, my gosh, you know, Nancy did this, Nancy did that. I don't really give a rat's behind about that. I was a poor kid from New York City with no father, no heat, no food, no electricity, and one grandparent away from food stamps. That was my life. I got tired of being told I was stupid and dumb and I'd never make anything of myself. Uh, it really hurt my feelings and it damaged me. I, I lived my childhood really angry because people, coaches didn't empower me. I might not have looked like the, the little girl that I should have been in the 60s and 70s. Coaching this team right here I look different than everybody else. Coaching in the NBA, Becky and I look different than everybody else. So the teamwork and the understanding and, you know, the word being collaborative. Collaborative means find out what's on my heart. Find out if I'm okay. Check on me. Um, Willie Colley Stein and I, we had a little pinky swear every day in practice. And we didn't have to say much, but I would look at him and I'd go, you good? And he'd say, yes. He goes, coach, you good? And I said, yeah. And we'd pinky swear that we would be there for one another. Because he kept saying to me, this can't be easy for you. And I kept saying to him, this can't be easy for you. A lot of pressure. But we were trying to achieve a goal together. And there's probably no handbook or no playbook for the story that I'm telling you about me and Willie or about me and, and you know, Seth Curry, who never got his warm-ups off for like 40 games. And every day I'd watch film with him. And I would just talk to him. And I would just always say to him, you know, Seth, you got to be ready. It's going to happen. He probably looked at me like, Coach, what the heck are you talking about? I bust my butt in practice every day. I come early. I stay late. I never play. And I kept trying not to convince him he was going to be a star. I convinced him that he had merit and that he had the ability to play in this league. But he had to stay with it. 
I mean, those pictures right there, I've got a, I've got a million of them. I'm probably trying to figure out what story I'm telling Seth Curry now, because he would, but he would, he would always lock in with me, and I really appreciated him trusting me. But you know, drip, drip, pour, pour. You build trust through actually going through every day of being there for somebody else, and. I mean, I look at him now, and, and you know, he went from making what seven hundred thousand with us, and now he's with the Mavs, and he's making six million. And it, it happened within a year, and it was just having that positive attitude, not lying to him, not telling him he was better than Rondo, not telling him he was better than his brother. It was just, it was just being, you know, it was being organic, and it was being genuine. And saying, here, you know what, this is what you got to do. I have, and here are your solutions. I have film for you. I'll be at the gym before and after if you need me. And we'll, we'll just, we'll walk through it together. But I don't know when your time's going to come, but it will. And then those last 18 games of the year when, you know, Rondo sat out and some of Darren Collison got hurt. And he was ready. He was ready. He was mentally ready for his moment. And so I ask you, the coaches, are you ready for your moment? There's somebody out there, and they need you to be ready for your moment. If you're not ready, then we're not going to be able to help our players and our kids and our children. Or when you bump into me somewhere, you need to be ready to, to be there for me. That's all we have. I mean, all we have is all we have. And we have to, like I said, on our worst day, we have to be better than people on their best day. And for me, all these years of coaching and playing, it just it does my heart great to know that, you know, Joe Alexander or Dan, uh, Antonio Daniels or, or, or Seth or, you know, all the guys that I've coached still reach out to me, still call me. Uh, and sometimes when you're in the foxhole with them, you know, I, I, I want to be in the foxhole with Antonio Daniels, with Marco Bellinelli, uh, quite frankly, with DeMarcus Cousins. Now, there's going to be some friendly fire, and they're going to kill a couple of us, but they're going to get the other guy, too. And I, I love being around those guys and, uh, and, and the women that I've coached in the WNBA. And now even with my son, who is going to be a professional athlete in Turkey, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I, I want to be in the fo I want to be in the foxhole with you, so we can share what we know with one another. We're all living it. We might as well share our stories. Great, I love it, Nancy. If we have a couple good questions that we'll come through on teamwork that I'd love you to address. Um, this one's from one of our baseball coaches actually on Long Island, where I know you grew up. Um, do you have any exercises you do to establish relationships with the team to have everyone on the same page with each other so that working with each other is easier and more efficient? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm going to tell you what I do every day. Um, I started uh, with a group of people that I would do – sorry, I'm looking down, but I'm pulling it up right here for you all um, – I started putting out, actually Dion, my brother Dion Sanders, he, he actually was the one who started putting out like a Bible verse or inspirational message. And then I started doing it about seven years ago. I do it five days a week. So it started out like with just my close friends. And then it was like Vinny Del Negro and Tommy Lasorda and Rick Carlisle and Mike Tomlin and, and Joe Girardi and, and Jason Garrett. And it started to grow where I have like, 35 or 36 guys, um, baseball, football, basketball, you know, Larry Fitzgerald, it doesn't matter. And every morning I start sending them an inspirational message. And now I started putting it on Twitter. So every morning on Twitter and on my website. So like today I sent one out and it says, uh, often everyone wants to be successful until they see what it really takes. Uh, the other day, I wrote something, uh, this might have been Thursday, never be afraid to try something new. Remember, amateurs built the ark, 
professionals built the Titanic. So I've been sending this out religiously, okay? I am, if I am nothing, I am anal and organized, and I do not miss a day. I mean, five days a week. So I was on a vacation maybe six, seven years ago. I, I took my mother to Israel, and I got a text from Jason Garrett from the, the Cowboys, and he goes, hey, sis, I don't want to be a taker, but I didn't get my morning message. And I thought, that's really cool that he missed the fact that I was in Israel, and I just, so I decided, you know what, there, there are no days for me that I get to take off if I say I'm going to do this. And I could just tell when people would respond to the message. So here, here's the, the closer on this story. I am, somebody sends me a New, York, New Yorker magazine about five years ago, and there's a story on Joe, Gir Joe Girardi, the Yankees manager. And in the story, it says that Joe has really found a way to connect with his players because a friend of his started sending him a morning message and he started taking the message into the Yankee locker room. And before they started their day, what they did was Joe would go around the room and he'd say, CC, well, what do you think about this quote about the Ark and the Titanic? Do you think often people don't really think about how hard it is to be successful and they go around the room and Jeter and all these guys would have to give their opinion, kind of like reading a Bible verse, everybody sees it differently. So I guess the players would like really enjoy for 10 minutes kicking around my, my morning message which Joe would share with the team. So I didn't, Joe never told me this, so, but I read it in New, New Yorker magazine. So then I'm doing an appearance with Jason Garrett, and he goes, you, you, you're not going to believe this. I said, okay, what? He goes, I'm down with the Yankees right now. I'm, I'm in spring training with our strength and conditioning coach. And he says to me, I'm sitting in the car riding over to the ballpark in Tampa, and they're, the Yankees' mind coach says, Cece, we're meeting in the locker room. Uh, before they get started in stretching, and CC, and so CC goes, oh yeah, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, talk about today's message. And Jason goes, what are you talking about? He goes, you know, Joe comes in every day, and he has this short inspirational message. So Jason Garrett calls me, and he goes, you're not gonna believe this. So I walk in, he says, to the, uh, the manager's locker room with Joe after hearing this with CeCe. And I'm, he's going to get to sit in in the Yankees' little meeting with their players before they hit the field. And Joe looks at Jason and goes, well, you know, we do this every day. Um, I have a friend of mine, and she sends me this inspirational message, and I share it because it helps us with teamwork. It helps bring pull and pull guys together and Jason goes where, where do you where do you get this message he goes well you know Nancy Lieberman is a friend of mine Jason goes in his jacket pocket pulls out his phone and he goes is that the message and he goes you're on the list and you never know like I even have some joy and excitement in telling you the story you never know who's sharing it with who but the Yankees and now the Cowboys have used that message with their team, and I've done it with my players, uh, and quite frankly with my son TJ, just so we can get some dialogue going, some teamwork, some belief, and just kind of talk it out. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I love it. And it's great to see that so many uh, other coaches across the the different leagues and different sports are using your messages, which aren't specific to basketball, but are, really can relate to every sport. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm glad I do it. There are some days that I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I can't stop doing. And it doesn't always have to be my own personal quote. It could be something that I saw that was impactful or made me think 
or you know, it was a great quote from Warren Buffett or you know Vince Lombardi and or or from you know my guy Muhammad Ali who I have taken or I've shared more of my you know 40 years of us being friends and just share the things that he has said to me that has been very impactful in my life. There's one other question before we move on from teamwork uh, that I'd love for you to address. Uh, it came from another baseball coach. Who said, what are some of the common threads you see in the most successful teams you've worked with or been a part of? It's a great question, and I, I will say this. I'm a huge uh, – baseball was my best sport until I went to the Olympics. And I am – no haters. I am a diehard Yankees fan uh, from the mats in my car to my keychains to throwing out the first pitch in Yankee Stadium and in Arlington. And I remember um, Nolan Ryan saying, well, Nancy, do you ever come to a Rangers game when the Yankees aren't playing? So I am deathly loyal uh, to the Yankees. And I, I call it a privilege to tell you the guys like, Winfield and Reggie Jackson and Jeter and A Rod and Paul O'Neill and uh, and uh, Jorge Posada. Th those guys are friends of, of mine. I just I just dig them. Um, another couple guys that affected my life was Bobby Valentine, um, you know, Tommy Lasorda, who I've known for a while, but Brooks Robinson, and most recently I've become friends with Cal Ripken uh, and his brother. I got an award at their foundation last year. To see the integrity, to see the respect, it, it's, it just comes down. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what sport you play. What are the rules that you're putting in place for your team? You, you have to set the tone early loud and often early before the first practice your professionalism how we're going to stretch how we're going to talk to each other how we're going to come to the to the the field and work together i mean i've gone in and spoke to the cowboys I've, i'm friends with mike tomlin i've done this with nfl teams um I, a matter of fact you know when uh what's his name uh crabtree uh was first coming out of uh, college, and Dion was having a combine, and Adam uh, Pagman Jones, he couldn't make it to this little combine. And Dion, I was just there visiting, and Dion's like, "Sis, you got to talk to these guys." And the the respect when when you kind of know what you want and get what you want, know how you want to run your team, know how to respect your assistant coaches. Know how to respect your trainers. Players see this. It's like parenting. I mean, if they know they can divide mom and dad, they will. If they know mom and dad are always fighting, they'll, they'll prey upon it. It's just natural instincts to divide and conquer people. So you get a chance to really set the tone. Uh, I tell my players, I am going to be your greatest PR machine. When you're trying to get to the league, when you're trying to get your first job, when you're, who do you think they're going to call? They're going to call me. So you need to be my greatest PR machine. Don't leak stuff out of our locker room. Don't tell people BS stories about we had this lady coaching us. It, so we set the tone. We never used the word woman coaching. We just said, we're going to be your great PR, greatest PR machines. Uh, if you have something to say, come talk to us. If you're bitching and moaning and complaining, then it's, it's just noise. If you have something rational to say, come to us in a manner that's respectful. And we, at 360 Communication, we want to know what's on your mind. We want to know what's on your heart. So you, you get a chance to control the narrative of how stuff is going to be handled in your organization. And I am tough. I'm fun, but I'm tough. And we're highly organized. And you know, we create the culture and we create the themes. Uh, I'll, I'll give you another example. We were the D League. We we're like the JV to the Mavericks. We didn't want our players to think they were just D 
D-leaguers or, you know, JV guys. So when we did outings together, even like little bowling stuff, it sounds crazy. But when the players walked in to the bowling, their names were on the board, spelled correctly. At each one of the lanes, the player had his shoe size pre-pulled for him. And we already had food for each and every one of those players. And the one thought and the, the, the commentary that we always got back was, man, they're so highly organized. They run this thing like, you know, with precision of professionalism. And when you set the tone of what you'll expect, then you'll set the tone for what your players give. If it's helter skelter and it's crazy and there's just, you know, it, it's a circus, don't get mad at the players when you get a circus back. Um, we, didn't, we, didn't, we don't keep our players in the gym that long. We come to work. We know exactly what we're going to do, but we have flexibility within that. But we don't want to keep them there and we don't want our players to be robots. You know, um, we, we tell them, don't play the play, play the game. And that's how we went about our business. And uh, I have found it to be really successful uh, in an organized manner. Great. Um, let's move to, to respect. I know you've talked about it a little bit, but um, I want to give you the opportunity to say anything else that you have on, on respect here. Well, respect isn't our birthright. Um, you have to earn it. I have to earn respect every day from every player, from every janitor, from every secretary. Just be nice. I mean, leave with love, leave with kindness. I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a tough kid, okay? I, I get it that I have to, you know, over-deliver. I can't be just as good. I have to be better than the people around me. But respect is just how you choose to deal with people. I mean, it's the little things. It's holding the door. It's, you know, how are you doing today, coach? How are you doing? It's like me walking with DeMarcus on the court every day or with Omri or with, you know, Bellinelli, uh, Rudy Gay. Like, hey, man, what's, what's up? How are you doing today? What's going on? How's the family? What's, what's the ba baby's mama's mama doing? Is, is it drama? How are the kids? You get to see them. It's, respect is investing yourself, investing yourself in the people that you're around. It could be a high five. It could be a chest bump. It could be a wink. It could be something that lets somebody know, A, you care about them, and you do want to know about their well-being. And did you have a good day? What's going on with the kids or wife? You know, some of these, some of these kids... Like, again, at my camp, some of these kids, we bring in huggers. We bring in, like, men and women who want to do something for charity, and we call them huggers, and they just go up to kids at camp, and they give them a hug and a high five and a smile. See, I, don't, I, I can't see any of you, but my smile makes you smile, and it doesn't cost anything. It's genuine. We don't know if these kids are getting fed when they go home. They don't know if they're getting berated, if they're getting abused. We don't know that. So when these kids, these players, these professionals are with you, man, that's like the, that's a cherry on top of the ice cream. They, you, Joe Girardi, I, I asked one of the players, I said, do you like it? you like coming in a ballpark to see Joe? It was Jeter. He goes, we can't wait to get here every day. I said, how's that? Most players don't, can't wait to get to see their coaches. He goes, Nancy, we, we can't wait to see Joe. He's so positive, and he protects us. And even when we screw up, he, he takes the high side with us. Now, in private, he'll be up front, and he'll be honest. But in front of the media, in front of people, Joe's rock solid. I want to be like Joe Girardi. I want my players, I want to give my, my players a reason to come to practice and to want to see me. I want to give my players a reason seven years later 
to pick up a phone and call me because they're happy that my son is playing pro basketball. I, I want I want those things. And if you want things, then you do it with, with love, kindness, respect. And and just be just be genuine with people. I, and I haven't used the word perfect because I am so far from being perfect. I battled with Joe. Battled with Joe Alexander. I battled with Antonio Daniels. I battled with Sean Williams. I battled with Rashad McCants. They will tell you. But I love them. And we went after it. But we did it with, with intent to be better. We, they had to make me better. I had to make them better. And as I would tell them in the locker room, we're doing life together. One of us is going to be at each other's you know, uh, weddings, and some of us are going to be at each other's funerals because we we have to do life together. These are really special moments that you have with your athletes, whatever the sport is. But we get so busy. I mean, my day is swamped, and but I have to be a good mom. I've got to be a great ambassador to, to still sports. I want to be a great teammate to everybody that's on this uh, webinar. And I know I have a, my day is not ending like your day is not ending. And somewhere, somehow, like we all have our different paths. But I know, like when I'm short or I don't want to have road rage. And I'm from New York, so it's kind of my birthright. I'm like, God, just help me, man. I'm like tired. I'm a little irritable today. But I, I could really use some help. You know, I, I could just use some help, and, and, and I need to show my good side, not my bad side. And I'm aware of that. And I, and I think you, you got to know what you know that you know. And the other strength in life is knowing what you don't know what you don't know. And you can ask, you know, someone to help you. So I've been on all those sides, um, and it's... It's fabulous, and I, you know, here I am, you know, spurting out, you know, all these stories about Derek Jeter and about Reggie Jackson and Muhammad Ali, and I can't believe that these human beings are in my life. I, I you know, I, I, I'm not bigger than the show. I'll never be like that. I mean, I met Ice Cube and LL Cool J the other day at the Big Three tournament, and they were like, "Oh my God, Nancy!" I was like. Mr. Cube, thank you so much. I was like, should I be calling you Mr. Cube? I don't even know what to say. <laughs> His wife started cracking up. She goes, I don't think anybody's called him Mr. Cube before. <laughs> but you know, here's me. A, a lot of a lot of laughter, a, a lot of joking around. There's a lot of sarcasm with me, but there's a lot of truth. So those are the things that I bring to the party every day with my players. And it could be Justin Dentman, whose agent tore me up and down because he said I was holding him back. And he disrespected me. Well, you know, I don't know why there's a woman coaching in the league. I said, you know, I don't really think you should be talking like that to me. I said, what I really think you should be doing is getting the game film from the last three games that we've played Reno. And Justin has 16 turnovers in three games. And I've asked him to stop throwing the ball to the, to the guy with the other color jersey. Okay? I've, I've asked him that. I've shown him film. I said, if you were really going to help Justin, you should sit him down and, and give him some truth, have a little fun with the film, but be honest with him. And don't ever pick up the phone again and tell me that I shouldn't be coaching because of my gender. Because that's going, that's going to get you out of this business quicker than you got in this business. So how do you talk to people? And I wasn't rude. Trust me. I'd like to go to New York and start talking like this, like, how you doing? What you saying? I know people who know people that hurt people like you. <laughs> but I'm no longer that New Yorker that didn't have conflict resolution. And I battled with my players. But... I battled them because I wanted them to be great. I wanted them to get out of the ghetto. I wanted them to make money. I wanted them to be more than people thought they could be. That's why Justin Detman 
comes to my house. When I, I was doing the TV, and, and, and hang on, it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back of this whole deal. Um, but I'm really proud of these things. I'm very humbly proud. Um, when I was doing the TV for three years for the Oklahoma City Thunder, when I knew I was going to Sacramento, Antonio Daniels, I called Antonio and I said, Antonio, I think you should take my place. I think I can get you the job at Fox doing the games for the Thunder. And he was like, Coach, I said, I think we can do it. And, you know, we've had moments, like, moments, that's all I'm going to say. But when his mom had cancer and he called me up at 5 in the morning and I met him at the gym and we were hugging and crying like two-year-olds, what do you need? How can I help you? Let's bring her down here. Do you need to go? It took us to a whole other level. I mean, the game really didn't seem as important as what could I do for this young man at the end of his career, and now his mom's sick. And he had already lost his brother to a heart attack. I grew up exponentially in my coaching career. It wasn't about history. It was about just being there for, the, for this guy. As part of the whole respect deal, and each one of us has to, you, you must. I'm a minimalist. I don't deal in question marks and commas. This is what I tell my team. We must do this. This is why these will be the results. You know, I told you I'm a little ADD. If you start telling me a whole long story, I'm like, what did they say? Just tell me what you want. I'm not a mind reader. Tell me you need me. Tell me. Pat Riley said that to me three and a half years ago. I said, Coach Ben, I really feel I'm ready. I'm ready to coach in the NBA. And he goes, Nancy, how long have I known you? I said, well, I played for you in 1980 on your first coaching gig with the Lakers. He goes, that's right. It was lady magic, not magic. And he said, Nancy, I've known you all this time. I did not know you wanted to coach in the NBA. And he, he was really stern with me on the phone. He goes, I'm not a mind reader. Tell people what you want. Greatest sage advice I've gotten in years. Tell people what you want. And then you've handled your side of it, the respect side. Be, be who you are in kindness. But whatever they do, you're not responsible for. But you're leading with the right respect, integrity, love. You know, you got to give me a reason to follow you if you're really a leader. And you got to do it all the time. You got to be the thread, the thumbprint of who you are. And Nancy, I think one of the things that I've learned from you over our conversations is I think that a lot of coaches get stuck in the hierarchy of being the coach or the boss. And I think what you've really done in a fantastic way with the Kings and other teams you've worked with is the respect you've shown those players has really helped you develop those relationships um, that have made you such a great coach. Relationships mean everything to me. I mean, look, I could pull out some business cards that tell you I run my charity, I do this, I do that. That, that doesn't mean anything. Just be a good person. Like I said, mean what you say, say what you mean, be authentic, help people, you know, lift when you rise, and everything else will fall into place. And, you know, habit is repetition. When you do things over and over and over and over and over, Again, becomes a habit, and then that is who you are. You know, I was talking to somebody uh, the other day, and I, I think I'm going to do this one day. So you know how you have like live your dash. So I hate to do this to myself, but 1958 dash question mark. The dash is not about us. The dash is what we did for other people, and I want to go interview celebrities or. And just say, what's your dash? And do a book on that. I think you would be, I, I ask people all the time, a young and old, I mean, what's your dash? You know, live your dash. My dash is others. I, when my time is done on this earth, 
you're you're not putting my cars, my homes, my jewelry, my money in an urn or in a coffin. That really won't be, you know, who I am. The legacy of who I am. The legacy will be what I did for other people. And as coaches, it's like doctors. It's like parents. It bothers the hell out of me when people say, "Well, you hold my you hold my kid back." No, I'm not. I'm not holding anybody back. Now, if your kid doesn't work that hard, or is not as interested, or he has other he or she has other things, or isn't a hard worker, don't blame me. But we will set your kid up for success if they want it. So I do kind of get ruffled when people say, like Justin's agent at one point said, I was holding Justin back. Like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And I'll take responsibility for things that I do, but I will not take responsibility for things that I did not do. I just won't. Um, you know, and we just have to be open-minded. You know, this was kind of a difficult thing. You remember a couple years ago when we, we were in Mexico and Rondo had that gay slur, um, you know, with the official. And we left Mexico, and the first thing I was like, Rajan, what are you doing? Why? It, but you know, sometimes you do things on emotion, you get, and, and that's that's tough. And people were saying to him, "You have to write a letter. You have to write a letter." Well, I have to tell you, I don't know how old people are on this call. Our generation wrote a letter. This generation, we have to learn from them. They talk in 140 characters or 30 second on Snapchat or Instagram with pictures and emojis. That doesn't make young people wrong. It just means we have to be open-minded to communicating with young people. I talk to them on Snapchat. I talk to them through emojis. I talk to them on texting. I'm not as much on LinkedIn or Facebook because this generation communicates differently. And we have to grow. We have to respect them. And you know, I tell this to a lot of coaches. So um, I'm gonna go back to that Rondo story. So Rondo first texted, if I did anything to hurt you, I'm really sorry. And I was like, Rajan, not good enough. Question mark, if I did anything to hurt you, well, you know you hurt him. You outed the man. I said, you need to take responsibility. Get rid of those, you know, the question mark and the commas are changing the narrative. So he went back and redid it. And it was like, I apologize, period. I know I hurt you, period. I am sorry. It was wrong of me. But he trusted me. That was a really cool part of this story is that Rondo trusted me and he knew that I would not throw him under the bus, but I wouldn't let him slide on something so important like that because it was going to affect his integrity and how people respected him going forward. And we, we have to be there for each other because we're going to slip up and we're going to make mistakes, but we also need that, that person who is strong enough uh, with love and kindness to say, uh-uh, not good enough. Nancy, um, I think you've talked about, you know, the next two core principles we have, um, but we'll start to get short on time here, are integrity and discipline. And I think you've hit on both of these, but I think it would be helpful is maybe you could just read some of the quotes that you gave us on integrity and discipline. Well, in, you know, integrity, we talk about that all the time. It's It's really the thumbprint of how you're going to live your life and what you're you're going to do for people. I, I've talked about consistency, you know, being intentional about what you do with people. Uh, we do have to behave with strong values uh, in all situations. That goes back to on your worst day, you know, uh, what are you doing on your worst day? Be who you are in the light that you are in the dark and put people first. And I'm, I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm just saying you have to, you have to master 
some reasoning of how we're going to interact with people. And by the way, integrity is not something people hear. Integrity is sometimes what people observe you doing. Like, um, I'm going to use, again, I, I like anecdotes. My son TJ uh, at the University of Richmond, there was this little boy who was bald, Colton, and my son would come out of the locker room after a game, and he, after playing whatever, 35 minutes, win or lose, he'd come out, he'd pick up the kid, he'd go to the court, he'd play with him, he'd let him dunk. And one day, I looked and I said, are you the father? I'm like, my son plays with your kid. He goes, my son has cancer. And TJ gives us tickets for me, my wife, and my son for every home game at the University of Richmond. And every game, he comes over before the game and he gives him a hug. And after every game, before he even goes into shower, he comes out and plays ball with him for five minutes. There's people all throughout the Richmond um, arena, the Robin Center, and I would be there and people would come up to me and say, do you know what your son has done for this little boy? People are watching us. Integrity is infectious. You have a chance to change how people go about their daily business. And um, it's powerful. Integrity is powerful. That's something, you know, I'm not in charge of my reputation, but I am in charge of my character. So we could get off this webinar and somebody can go, I don't really like her, or she talked too much about herself, or there's just something that rubbed me wrong, and you're entitled to that. But I'm in charge of my character. And I'm in charge of how I lead my life and what kind of mom I am, what kind of friend I am, what kind of business partner I am to skill sports or the other people that I work with. And, and that means something to me. Um, every day, uh, you know, I want to make people happy for their, their time with me. I, I don't want to get on this call, well, I'm a Hall of Famer, or I'm this, or I'm that. I'm just like you. I'm grinding every single day trying to do my part and trying to make a difference in this crazy world. And if we can do it together, there's strength in numbers. So Nancy, I've got a couple of questions that I'm hoping you can address uh, before we wrap up here. Um, the first is, who are your main influencers in leadership, uh, whether it be coaches, teammates, or away from the sport? Um, well, I would have to say uh, early on, my influences were all the, the guys at Rucker Park when I was 11, and I stole $2 from my mother's purse, didn't tell her, and I told her that I was going to be at the park. She thought it was the park across the street, and I took the A train into Manhattan, switched trains to the E, and went to 155th and Malcolm X Boulevard and walked into Rucker Park, and everybody was like, are you lost? I'm like, no, are you? Um, I was 11. The guys at Rucker Park, they didn't judge this little white kid, this little red-headed white girl. They empowered me. They called me fire, and we actually had to create friendships because there was no cell phone, there was no webinars, there was no internet. We actually, I'd be like, They'd say, Fire, what time are you, when are you coming back? I said, if I can steal $2 again, I'll be on the Thursday train. And, and they would meet me at the station, walk me in the park as for nobody to, you know, kind of rough me up. And then they'd ride the train home far rock away with me. And my mother was like, who are they? And I'm like, they're my friends. And I'm like, they're hungry. Can you feed them? So I was teaching my mother through these guys about not profiling, not being racist, not judging. And I'm grateful to my friends in Harlem and Rucker Park for believing in me before it was popular to believe in me. Then Muhammad Ali, who's my hero, and we met when I was 19, and I, I'll never forget sitting in that room uh, with him and 
he said to me after we spent like 30 minutes together, he goes, there will not be another day that I'm not in your life. And I was like, Mr. Muhammad, I, I need you. I need you because when I didn't even know you, you were telling me what to do and showing me what to do. To the day he died, I mean, when I was coaching in Sacramento, eight months before he died, he came to the game. They promised me that if I coached in the NBA, that he would come see me with Lonnie, his wife. And they were in the suite right behind our bench. And there he was. The goat. And my, play, my like the players were like, man, the champ is here. What's the champ? And somebody goes, oh, that's coach's friend. And they're like, what's he doing here? And I just said, he just, he loves me. That's why he's there. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy stories. And, um, and I learned a lot of my discipline, lastly, from the, from the Jacksons, uh, from Michael and his brothers, because I was friends with them for 25 years. And I'd stay at the house, and I'd see how disciplined they were, how they treated fans. It was amazing. Um, I've been really blessed. And I learned toughness from that woman that I miss every day, Pat Summit, who was my Olympic teammate, my panel. An American teammate. I played for her on the USA team, and of course, my four years playing against her in Old Dominion in Tennessee. This woman was no joke, and she was tough on me, but she she helped make me who I am, and she taught me so many life skills about sticking it out and not quitting when things were going on going bad for me. That. Um, I just I just miss her. I miss hearing her voice, and I miss that accent. Nancy, how are you doing today? <laughs> she was just so influential to me, and I, I I love the people that I've mentioned, and I understand they all had a place in my life, but they they helped make me who I who I am. Great. One one last question, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, at what age do you think that we can start teaching the core values you talked about? Obviously, a lot of your experience is at the professional level, but when can you start teaching these things to youth athletes? You can do it. Uh, there's, we have three and four year old kids at my camp. Um, you know, matter of fact, I was talking uh, to the Romo family day before yesterday, and Hawkins, uh, Tony's five year old, he was a five or three in one on the way. And I mean, we've had three-year-olds at camp. We're not Nancy Daycare, by the way. I mean, we're serious basketball, but we have a peanuts uh, division. But kids are smart. They can learn. They can learn. Just just teach them. You can't, it's like being in a huddle. You don't give them six things to think about in a 30-second, 20-second huddle, time out. Give them two things to focus on, or maybe just one thing to focus on. And, but kids are adaptable. They can learn. I mean, we do drills at camp, and we take the, the peanuts, and we have the peanuts demonstrate. I, have, I can have my peanuts, and I have it on film. They run the hurry-up offense. If we, they run Dave Yeager's offense. We call it the hurry-up. And we teach them uh, you know, on-ball screens, DHO, second side action, and we put a microphone, and they go, we're running a DHO. And what do we do on the other side? Second side action. What happens? Wide pin downs. You can teach these kids. I mean, they don't have to be, you know, obviously, if you're teaching professionals, you know, there's age and ability and experience. Kids can be taught. I see it. I see what the Ripkins are doing with their baseball, uh, their fields. I mean, I see what Cal and his brother and, and the, 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 the Ripkin Foundation is doing with curriculum and kids. And, we're doing that with our dream courts, where we're teaching communities and kids to, to love police officers and to hug cops. And you know, we're, we've gifted 38 of our dream courts around the country, and we'll be at 50 by the end of the year. And cops are playing ball with little babies who are now looking at them as heroes instead of adversary. So we can do this together. I know we can. Great. 
Nancy, well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been extremely valuable. You had a lot of great insights and a lot of great stories that I know our coaches will take a lot from. Uh, we had some of our leading coaches across the country that were able to join us that are in management roles today. And then this video will be shared with all of our coaches across the country, which is a total of about 300 coaches in both exercise and fitness, uh, soccer, and baseball. Um, so, Nancy, we're just extremely pleased to have you on the advisory board and involved with us, and really want to thank you for your time today. My pleasure. I wish everybody the best of luck, and I, I wish you all intentional greatness. So, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Yep. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you.